right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you've been joining us for our epic cross-country virtual road trip in partnership with Parks Canada and Royal Canadian Geographical Society, you will know that we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And it has been such a fun tour. It's actually quite sad that we're nearing the end of it fairly soon with our last two broadcasts this week. But if you've joined us, we've gone out east to Kejimkujik and Kuchibuguac. We've gone to Quebec to Gros Isle and Saguenay St. Lawrence up north to the Northwest Territories with Nahani and Pingo, and out west with Fort Rod Hill, and just yesterday we went to Jasper. Today we are going to the closest location to my personal house. Uh, we also have a huge Southern Ontario audience, a lot of whom got in touch before today's broadcast to highlight how special a place uh, our, our, you know, our tour location today is to them. So it's really, really exciting to get to continue this fun uh, today with you guys. Welcome into our, our many hundreds of kids uh, from across Canada, the US, and beyond. And so today we are going to continue in telling stories of Indigenous people's uh, existence in Canada for many, many thousands of years. We are going to the Georgian Bay Islands National Park and Beausoleil Island National Historic Site today to learn how to make a 5,000 year old flint arrowhead with Sean. So we're going to learn about the tools, techniques and basics of making stone arrowheads, the same as Indigenous people did on Beausoleil Island over 5,000 years ago. So see Sean Corbier make a flint arrowhead, attach it to an arrow with pine resin and sinew, and we'll have the chance to ask him questions about the traditional lives of Ojibwe people in the Georgian Bay region of Ontario. Ontario. I hope you guys are as excited as I am about today's presentation. Flint napping is something that I've been fascinated with since I was a very little kid, so we're in for a real treat today. And without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Sean, and take us away. Hello, bonjour, bonjour, how's everybody doing this morning? I'm in the beautiful town of Wabashi and sunny out here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful day. So hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Canada's smallest national park. I am the Indigenous Outreach Officer for the park. I've been uh, with the park for about uh, approximately 15 years. Uh, and I love my job. Uh, it's one of the best jobs on the planet. All right. Parks Canada has a mandate. Parks Canada is privileged in its role as a steward of outstanding cultural and natural treasures that represent the richness, the richness and the cultural diversity here in Canada. So that's it in, in a little bit of a nutshell. Um, we're also in the traditional ter territory of our indigenous folks. So I'm going to give a, a, a nice little land, uh, land acknowledgement here. So again, welcome to the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, here on Wendat, Anishinaabe, and later Métis people. I'm also going to introduce myself in my traditional language, which is Ojibwe. So here we go. Ani Shan Dishnakash at Chijak Dodum. Chiging Dongjaba. So what I said there was my name is Sean. I belong to the Crane clan. Uh, I was, my, my indigenous community is on beautiful Manitoulin Island called Chiging, but I also live in my little town here called Wabashin. And Wabashin actually means it's a First Nation word, and it means where the rock meets the water or the water meets the rock. We live in a really unique area, area here in Georgian Bay, uh, really, really unique so much that it's been designated by UNESCO uh, as Georgia Bay Biosphere Reserve. So that's really, really cool. And there's only a handful of them in the world, uh, but we have a few here in Canada. So, that, so that's really, really, really cool. All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about our First Nations communities, we know that the island uh, was utilized over 12,000 years ago, or not 12,000 years, but 12 different cultures utilized the island. And, um, it's just uh, there's some rich cultural resource out there, and uh, hopefully today, flint napping. Uh, we're going to show you how to make an arrowhead. Uh, according to our Parks Canada archaeologists, we know that stone tool manufacturing was going on on Bosley Island. Okay, all right. With no further ado, let's roll our first clip, Jesse. All right, Fairy Lake, everybody, steeped in legend, and spiritual guidance for for some of our indigenous women it's one of our inland island lakes uh, very beautiful uh so fairy lake and there's a really really cool legend about that and there's a nice nice takeaway shot uh from fairy lake which is really beautiful you can see our beautiful windswept pines as well so very very iconic uh of georgia bay which is really neat all right we got a couple more pictures to show you 
All right, this is the, as I said, the windswept pines. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the group of seven. Uh, their inspiration was actually up in the north end of the park because of the windswept pines. And there's a shot of the archipelago. We're, we're in the largest freshwater archipelago on the planet. Um, you might have heard of 30,000 islands. There's over 30,000 islands out there. Uh, there's roughly 90,000 shoals and approximately 59 species of fish that actually live in Georgia Bay. Georgian Bay itself um, is 15,000 square kilometers, so it's huge. Now, the other really cool thing about our park is that we straddle two equazones. This is where the St. Lawrence Lowland region meets the Canadian Shield. Um, you can see it on the map. So if you look to the, to the right of your map, you're going to see the Canadian Shield all from the Ice Age, from two miles thick of ice, gouging out all these great big holes along the Canadian Shield, and then... Just a little south of that, to the left, you'll see what we call sedimentary stone. So this is where these two meet. And where these two meet, our island actually cuts halfway through it. So if I was to take you from the southern end, from Beausoleil to northern end, we're going to go from southern Ontario to northern Ontario. The only place in Canada that you can do that walking, like on an island. And you can see the, the, the transition zone as you walk through southern to the northern end. So that's really cool. Um, we also know that our indigenous folks you utilize both for uh, for food stuff. So from uh, or, or utility. So from the shield and from the Saint Lawrence Lowland region. So that's that's really really neat. Really really cool. Uh, next slide. Ah, our indigenous history on the island. Between 1836 and 1856, um, there was a reservation period on the island. Um, and back then, they had a really hard time to live off the island. They were trying to live the colonial way. And um, some of their homesteads are actually pretty rustic as well. Can we move to the next slide? So here we have some uh, archaeology. Uh, archaeology is uh, we have an archaeological dig every spring. Uh, we don't have it anymore, but uh, we plan to get back into it sooner or later. But it's a great opportunity to uh, share our archaeology uh, with Indigenous folks. We'd have um, we'd have an Indigenous camp. Uh, we did have one when the, when the archaeologists archaeologists were there, and it was kind of neat to watch these Indigenous kids get in there, and they were actually sifting through and looking for little pieces of chert and and uh, other pieces of what they can find. So it was a learning experience for them because it's their culture that they're actually digging out of the ground. Now, Parks Canada can't just, uh, the archaeologists can't just dig anywhere. This site here is called Camp Kitchy. I don't know, some of you ever been to Camp Kitchy from Ontario? Yes? No? Some of you guys have, might even see me there doing some programming. But what's been happening there, Camp Kitchy's been there since 1919. And what's been happening is that the, the youth have been running up and down the shoreline. or It's an old drumlin. And what's happening is the ground is vibrating and they're, they're vibrating to the surface. So there's a lot of surface finds. That one big blade knife uh, to your right, it's the biggest artifact and one of the oldest that we have. So we know it's over 5,000 years. Um, and it's made out of quartz. And quartz is really hard to nap. And some of our elders have suggested that somebody, one of our ancestors who made it, had to be really skilled. Myself, as a foot napper, I am just beginning. So if you guys know Star Wars, I am a Padawan learner. Okay, I'm not a Jedi yet. But I'm getting there. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, and you have to secure the right stone to do it as well. So I have some some chert. Uh, I have some Onondaga chert here from the southern end of Lake Ontario. We have some slate. Now, one thing about the slate knife, the slate knife is really cool because it comes off the Canadian Shield. Okay. So remember what I mentioned about those two transition zones, Indigenous people using both for utilizing uh for food stuff or for utility or stuff to use to make stuff with, okay? Uh, we also have an end scraper here, perfect for a hide processing. So they string up their big hides. This would have been on a half the don stick, and then it would have been scraped. And here's one that I have made. Very beautiful. This uh, type of chert is from, uh, it's called Flint from uh, Texas, I believe, so Texas Flint. It's hard to come by this stone, so that's another reason why a lot of people don't do it. 
it's hard to get the stone to do it and it has to be the right stone i'll touch on that a little bit later um and the other thing i wanted to, wanted to say that about archaeology is it has to do with human occupancy on the island so we know over five thousand years ago that stone tool manufacturing was uh, actually going on on the island and uh it's been really really exciting for me because since i've been working there i get to see some of my cultural ancestral stuff come out of the ground and um and it's just it's just amazing i i'm sort of lost for words for it so that's that's really cool for me i really i really 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 like that now the other thing about uh about the park itself we know that um we're, we're also in the world's biosphere reserve as i mentioned earlier uh, unesco is a is a world heritage organization that helps preserve natural areas so on that map earlier, if we can go back to that map, is that possible? The map of the park? There we go. So I lived in, in if you look down in the bottom there, there's a little town called Wabashina. And I mentioned earlier, rock meets the water or the water meets the rock. And um, so the world biosphere actually stretches from Port Severn all the way up to 12 Mile Bay, which is way up on the archipelago there. So that's really neat. And I just thought I'd, I just wanted to clarify that for you guys. Okay. All right. Uh, what else did I have? All right. So maybe we can get right to foot napping. Uh, for me, foot napping is uh, is the art of of still to manufacturing. There is a um, in the dictionary they say these big words. So I, in my opinion. Uh, it's the art of uh, stone tool manufacturing or or making a stone tool, so such as these arrowheads and that sort of thing. Okay, so with no further ado, uh, we're going to run this 10-minute uh, clip. I hope you enjoy it, and I'm going to come back, and we're going to show you a little bit more stuff, and then we'll take some questions. All right? All right, Jess, can you see this nice here? ridge right here? Mm-hmm. That's the one I'm going to go for. So okay. the first thing i got to do again is i got to make a platform, right? So I'm going to take this crazy stone. Now, you can use any other stone, of course. Even this stone would work. So what I'm doing is just taking off all the little spurs at the end. Because if I don't do this, uh, my energy will get dispersed in different different directions if I don't make it all in one good piece here. And we keep in mind, um, anything anything under 90 degrees, you can nap off. Anything over, it's, you're going to smash your piece, so it won't work. So that's really important. Anything under 90 degrees. So I look at this piece. Pretty close. Yeah. I'm a little under, so I should have no problem there. Okay. Okay. This time I'm gonna take it. I'm after this little edge here. I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna shove it in my but this time let's try a different bopper. Let's try one of my uh one okay. of my shore bopper. You can see it's got a heavy scar there from me smashing it before. Yeah. So let's see what this will do a little bit better. One, two, three, here we go. I'm gonna shove it into my thigh as hard as I can. A little smash with the right tool. And this is what happens. It comes right off, energy falls the oh, ridge. Oh wow, perfect, and wow. this could be a beautiful arrowhead. When I'm, when I'm wow. There. So that's the whole trick about smashing your edge. Make sure you got a strong platform there. And remember, energy always falls right. So that's called spalling, what you did. <clears throat> yep. You just took a flake off the core and the process was called spalling. spalling okay. So there's a little ridge there. See that little ridge? That's the one yeah. I want after. I want to make sure. Yeah. This platform is stronger. Pull it on a little bit of the side. And I up oh, the other thing I'm doing too is my fingers also applying pressure there. Okay. Because memory energy always falls rich and it always the more harder I push the further the energy goes. Okay, so show which direction you're So this one here is I'm gonna go this way. Okay. Yep. Oh, oh, I just broke my piece in half. Oh. But that's oh, that okay. Happens. That that's happens. okay. I can still do it now. I got a nice, nice 90 degree there to take off a little bit of this ridge. And maybe I'll be coming to the right thickness already because okay. I'm almost there already, right? Yeah, that's true. Really got a little nice. way to go. What a beautiful piece of lightning glass you're working with. So I'm going to take a, make a platform here. And I'm going to 
gonna see if I can freehand this. Now, when I'm gonna try and freehand, mm -hmm. I'm gonna put that along my finger. Yeah. I'm gonna push down, and hopefully, I'll get a get a much to come off there. Okay. Ooh. So see it fall a little bit of yeah. that ridge there. Yeah. Could Didn't take it all more. the way down, but yeah. that's yeah. I'm gonna shake this a little bit more here. Shape, a little bit of thickness there. I'm gonna make a little abrasion here. A little platform there. Freehand that off. Okay. I'm starting to get a little bit to the point. So you can see that it's a little bit slooping this way. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna try and freehand a little bit off here. You can see that there's a little bit of a ridge there. Let's see up close. It's a little small ridge. Yes, of right course. there. Yes. That's the one I'm gonna get off. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna make a platform. Make sure I'm nice and right where I want. Oh, the smoke from the fire smells so good. Rub it. Really good. I'm gonna put my finger. Just add some pressure. I'll take my tin. Hopefully, I'll get a nice little, nice little piece come off. Oh, nice. Okay. Now, you see there's another small one there. I'm going to try yeah. for that one, too. Okay. Just the abrasion stone because I want a nice, strong platform. And I'm just I'm just actually shaving right where that where I want the, where the beginning of that ridge is. That's what yeah. I'm doing. That concentrated area. I'm going to freehand this. A little pressure there. And by freehand, you mean you're just kind of holding it above your knee, yeah. not putting pressure up That's with right. your leg. That's right. And I'm just using my finger as the pressure. Okay. And I'm holding the piece like this. So I'm okay. trying to remember, I'm just trying to make the energy fall as far into the stone as far as possible. So we got a little bit of shape. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to abrasive this all the way around my piece. I'm making a nice, strong platform. So I'm going to shape it a little bit more. Now we got abrasion all the way around. Oh, I see a little mark here. I can take off a little bit. And that's what's great about these antler tins. Like they're nice little weight, perfect to swing, and you know, it's all in the wrist. Mm. It does take practice though. Once you get to hang it, it's a lot of fun. But you've done this all with natural hammer stones and yeah, yeah. antler tines, which are, which would have been the traditional Tools, tools before they were the copper. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay, there's that one I'm gonna work on. Let's see if I can get it here. Oh, I actually broke it a bit there. I'm gonna make a double one maybe. That's kinda cool. So that's okay. I'm gonna go this way now. So you notice that I did break it. Sometimes that's what happens. Yeah. But you just reduce it, make another tool out of it. That's why they call it an art. But you gotta make another tool. As long as I can get this sharp little edge going in. Oh, a little bit more here. So what would cause it to break? Uh... Well, there could be fine little fractures in the, uh, in the stone itself. Like glass, you can pretty well see all the way through it and you see there's no cracks. But sometimes there's really fine what we call uh, these are radial fractures. There's uh, hinge fractures that you get from the stone depending on which way you hit it. All right, so we abrase the edge. I'm going to take my copper pressure flaker and I'm going to push against this edge hard as I can, and I'm going to pull down and hopefully I'll get a pressure flake off. Okay. okay. So I'm gonna hold it in my hand like this. I'm gonna be flat against my piece of leather. Yeah. I'm gonna take my pressure flaker. I'm gonna apply a little pressure right there. 
Ooh, that was a you nice snap. You hear that snap. little clip? When you hear that little clip, that means I got a nice pressure for like, that came off, okay? Nice. So, in doing that, I created two ridges. So there's one there and there's one there. So my next pressure flick is gonna be this next little small ridge here, okay? okay. And then we'll go all the way along. There's one, two, three, There, and I created, look at those beautiful pressure flakes. Oh, beautiful, right along that top edge. Yep. Can you point them out? Just right along that nice edge. Beautiful. And I created two ridges all the time I come off, so my next one will be at that next ridge. Okay, we're gonna do that one. No, we'll do this side. All right, we'll try with the antler 10. Same thing, I'm gonna take my ridge. It's a little tougher with the antler. It's not as fine. It's not as fine, but it leaves a unique mark. Oh, there you go. There's the snap. Give me a couple more. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Now there's that edge with the. Yeah. They're bigger, ain't they? A little yeah. bit bigger flex yeah compared to my makes sense though because the right. tip is a little bit bigger yeah i, I actually got to file that down a little bit so to sharpen your bone with uh with these because you're gonna have to sharpen them uh so you just take your hammer stones and then you want a square edge mm -hmm. not a round mm. <clears throat> you just take it you don't file it because you're just going to ruin it you're going to waste it okay. all i'm going to do is restretch it out and it'll oh. last you a lifetime Oh, so, I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna so you're not taking it out, you're str oh. I'm just stretching it, make sure it's a square point. Interesting. Okay. And then there you go. I stretched it out and I'm ready to do another round. Wow. And I didn't waste anything. Nice. Find yourself a nice, you can use your abrasion stone or whatever. And then what you can do with this antler is, because I, I, you, you want a nice little point. You see it's still, it's starting there. Hmm. Actually, it goes fairly quickly. That's all. That's all you want is a little yeah. point. I'd go a little bit more than that. Huh. And then, yeah. Cool. And then that's it. Sean, before we go back to live and you and you explain a little more, I've just got to say, it's so fun for me because not only was I absolutely spellbound just sitting like this the entire video, but all our teachers were too. And just such a special thing. So thank you so much for that. That was so, so oh, cool. Thank you. All right, I hope you guys like that little uh, little demonstration there. I know it's hard to see through the camera. With COVID-19, uh, this is our response, and uh, we've been working from home, and uh, it's been great. I have a few children, so homeschooling is uh, I, with the teachers there. Uh, but it's all it's all it's all fun. Um, the other the other thing that uh, that kind of type of what I was actually working on there is actually man-made glass. So I have a big chunk of it here. Really nice place. But one thing about the stone and the glass, it breaks conchoidally, meaning, I don't know how well you guys can see that, that little roundness looks like a shell. All the silicates, flint and chert, they all break that way. So no matter which way I smash a ridge, it's always gonna go that direction that I smash in. So that's, that's really neat. It's really unique about the stone. The science behind flint napping is really, really cool. I know they probably didn't know that back then, but if I was to smash this stone with a hammer stone and I slowed it down in, in, in slow mo, you can see the ripples in it. You can see just like how you throw a rock in the water, the ripples, eh? It's pretty neat. And what I meant by uh, by energy always falls a ridge. So I have a, a nice big ridge right there. So the harder I press onto my thigh, the harder I press, the further the energy goes in. So if I wanted the big flake off. So that's really, really neat. In the park. We know that that our indigenous uh, ancestries uh, ancestry had to go back up to 200 kilometers or so to go secure some chert and then bring it back to the island. And keep in mind, they're actually in birch bark canoes. So Georgian Bay, I call it big water. It gets pretty rough out there sometimes. But yeah, they had to travel in canoes to go go and get their chert. And when they did go get it, 
they didn't bring it back in big slabs. They brought it back in what we call nodules, okay? Like little pieces that they can work, which is pretty neat. So we got white chert from Manitoulin Island. There's a Heronia Pebble chert. As I said, there's Onondaga. There's uh, Kettle Point chert from uh, Lake, Lake uh, I guess it would be the southern eastern end of Lake Huron. So, and it was actually traded quite a bit. Like for this one, for example, this is what we call a preform. And this, uh, according to our elders, uh, this would, could have been possibly a trade item. I would trade this with a different, uh, with a different tribe. They would take it back to their territory and they would do their own style. Okay, like there's, there's different styles. There's Brewerton style, there's Otter Tail, which is, which is pretty neat. And they actually made fishing projectile points as well, okay? Now we know that some of these arrowheads that were falling in the park, they wouldn't have been on a bow and arrow. They're too big and they're too bulky, okay? The bow and arrow's over 3,000 years old here, but this is this dates back thousands and thousands of years, okay? So I'm a, I'm a carver as well. So I, I have some very beautiful atlatls here. I don't think you can see them. In my language, we call them a pa, genatig, a tadwin, and it's all the action and how you throw it. So they were used for woolly mammoths, mastodon, woodland caribou, the cool little story about how they find them here in Ontario. We don't actually find find the sticks themselves, and the reason being is because they're actually really biodegradable. But the only things, uh, the only thing that is left, of course, is this stone. Okay. In the Canadian Arctic, the ice is melting, and they're finding the actual sticks and the actual big arrows. The actual arrow is actually six to eight feet. This is only four feet. And how they're finding them is that after the ice has melted, they're finding them in caribou poo, Ooh. which is kind of kind of neat. And, and it's an indication that when the when the caribou were inundated by black flies and mosquitoes, they'd actually go onto this big sheet of ice to digest their food to get away from the bugs. And this is when they were ambushed. Okay. Now the other cool thing about this tool is that um, it was a communal tool. It wasn't used individually like the bow and arrow was. It was used always as a group effort, okay? Um, Adelaide itself is an Aztec word, and it means weapon of war, okay? So really, really cool tool. Uh, they find them in here in Canada, and again, here in Ontario, it's just a really biodegradable. Now, the arrow itself, I had carved this out of black ash. I used, uh, I think it's late woodland, woodland pear Cherokee style. It's only two feathers, but it looks like I got four. And let me open it up here. So all I did was took two turkey feathers, and then I half them together, and then I do a traditional wrap. And then I fold them down. And just the way the curvature of the arrow is, or of the feathers, the fletching, they automatically go right on the side. So they, they create that, that perfect fletching, okay? Now, I didn't uh, put my arrow head on here yet. I'm in the process of doing that. Uh, but, but it would have been with pine pitch. And pine pitch is just uh, just a sap coming out of a pine tree, uh, but it's melted down and it's uh, added with ash, usually hardwood ash. And that's what they use for their canoes. So if they traveled in their canoes along the rivers and stuff like that, if their canoe started to leak, they'd have this big stick of, uh, of uh, pine pitch and they just heat it up in the fire and just re redo their stitch. It's really, really cool how they do it. Uh, so the Adelato. Now, some of the tools, uh, tools, you know, Atlerton. So I have, a, I have a moose. Moose was used as well. So if you see this big moose here, uh, what have it chopped off? This could have been like a nice big bopper at the end. And I also have some deer antlers. These are perfect for, for pressure flaking. So that's why I cut it off, and then I use it for a, a small bopper or a shaper, some people call it. But copper is used uh, nowadays, of course. Uh, copper is soft. You need a, you need a material that is soft but yet hard. So copper is hard but it's soft. It allows you to to get in there and grab the uh, grab the chert and and snap it off. Here I have a thumb guard, hand stitched by myself, and then I have another pad. You need protection when flint napping. I wear uh, safety glasses. Well, that's why I have this this big piece of leather here on my on my thigh, so I don't get hurt. Works very good. Absorbs, absorbs some of the, the percussion. Now, the finishing part of that arrowhead, which was, wasn't on there, I wanted to show you personally, is called corner notching. Okay, this is, this corner notching, 
this corner notching right here that's what this part uh, is going to go into the wood to your shaft and this is where i'm going to rub, rub my or wrap my sinew or animal gut and then one thing about animal gut when you wrap it it once it dries it it, it becomes hard and then i'll take my pine pitch and then i'll i'll weather it for so the weather doesn't get at my um at the string or the animal gut or sinew okay so corner notching so i'm going to take my my uh my pressure flicker safety and what i'm going to do is i'm going to take that little edge i don't know how well you can see that so i'm going to take my pressure flicker i'm just going to put it in there and that's all i'm doing push push that flakes coming off and i'll get my nice beautiful corner notching okay but foot napping is a lot a lot of fun i really enjoyed it so one last thing i wanted to show you This is obsidian. Now this is volcanic glass, okay? It's just cooled real quick in the water. So that's really cool and becomes glass. Uh, my son plays Minecraft. I know some of you guys probably play Minecraft and uh, it's in that game. And I think, I believe it, you, you secure it and then you move to another dimension, the Netherland, I think it is. I don't play Minecraft myself, of course. But I just wanted to show you some volcanic stuff. So really, really cool, okay? Some volcanic glass. And then, of course, we got our chert. Here's a big chunk. This is the core where I was talking about earlier. This is where I'd be smashing off these ridges here. One there, I can get a couple of nice, beautiful blades out of this Kewl Cook shirt. So that's really, really, really neat. Now, we also know that the chert itself has another quality to it. As long as you have hardened steel, carbon steel, you can get a spark off it. A spark. Interesting. All right. This is Jasper, okay? I'm gonna take this steel striker, and we actually have, we actually found them, it's broken this one, but we actually found some, uh, the Parks County archeologists um, had found one, and it was what we call a double monkey tail. And it could, it, was, it could have been one of the gifts from the government giving gifts to the indigenous folks um, from the island, so that's kind of neat. But how they work is, I'll take this, I'm gonna, hopefully you guys can see this, I don't know how well you can see the sparks. You can see a little bit of it. I'm going to take this char cloth and I am going to see if I can get a, a spark onto this and we'll see what happens. Okay. One strike. Okay. You ready? I want you guys to count the three. You ready? All right, look what I did. I got a spark onto there. This is just cotton. It's cooked in the fire in a tin can, and then there's a chemical process that happens in, the, in that can. It's not quite ash, but it turns to charcoal, and that's why they call it charcoal. So now I can move to my nest, my grass or something, or birch bark, and I can start a fire that way. But we all know what the oldest method is, right? Which would be the friction method, okay? So that's a chart cloth there. So that's, so that's really, really neat. All right, quick little wrap up, everybody. So we know over 5,000 years that stone tool manufacturing was going on on the island. And we also know between 1836 and 1856, we have a reservation period for some of our indigenous folks. These folks actually moved to another island called Christian Island, uh, but they kept the name Beausoleil, so therefore Beausoleil First Nations. Uh, they're really close to the park, of course. And uh, we also know uh, we're in the world's biosphere reserve. Uh, we like to boast that we have the most amphibians and reptiles anywhere in Canada here as well, 33 in total. Uh, we're also home to uh, the Massasauga rattlesnake, um, one of two, only two left in Canada. We have the prairie rattler out west, and then we have ours here in the eastern end of Georgian Bay, uh, Massasauga rattlesnake. And for you guys that don't know, Massasauga is an indigenous word, and it means large river mouth, okay? When our men went fishing down in the springtime, this was the snake that would come out and rattle its tail, so hence the word large river mouth, okay? And the last thing about the rattlesnake is, to my indigenous culture, it represents the plant protector. For example, if I was picking blueberries and my muckuck or my basket was really full, um, the snake would come along, rattle its tail to let me know to move on and let other animals come in and eat, or, or medicines for human picking medicines, okay? Other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. 
Uh, thank you for uh, for coming along here at George Bayans National Park, Bolsa Island National Historic Site. Jimmy Gwich. Sean, that was so incredible. The only bad part about this presentation is that it can't be like three times the length. Um, this was fantastic. You're also the first speaker in our entire Parks Canada series to reference both Star Wars and Minecraft. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go live to our teachers. We've got more questions than we can possibly answer in 20 broadcasts on YouTube already. And I'll provide a link at the end where you guys can learn uh, how you can share those questions with us. But I want to start by going to Miss Michael's class. They're joining us uh, across the border in Glenview, Illinois. If you want to kick us off with a question Ms. Michael come on in and take us away okay. um okay I'm going I have a student named Jaya who has a question for you Jaya um hi Jaya how how many tools does it take to make an arrowhead because I saw you using different types of hammers and types of tools and each one was different okay how many types of tools great question uh, when I was taught the taught the art, I was only given two, three tools. So we're looking at boppers, and we're looking at pressure flakers, but we're also looking at hammer stones. Okay, with these three, you could actually make an arrowhead. But great question. Very, very cool. Thank you so much for our, our first one to kick us off. Let's go to Mr. Clark joining us in Espanola, Ontario. If you have one for us, come on in. I do. Um, we, were, we were, hi. We were wondering. Um, back in the day, who was in charge in the community making the arrowheads? Was it a anybody make them? Great question. Um, anywhere from eight years old or so, the kids would actually start as soon as they could hold a hammer stone and start smashing stone. You got to remember, we didn't live long back then like we do today, and we were a lot smaller people back then as well because of the food that we eat nowadays. We evolution we tend to get bigger um but yeah i hope that answers your question yeah fantastic thanks guys thanks mr clark uh we've got uh tons of versions of this question coming in in our youtube chat bar and so it's how many arrowheads have you found in the area is there a particularly rare thing that you found in the archaeology team or, or what can you tell us about what's going on in the, the historic site well as i said about the human occupancy goes back thousands of years um but it's just the it's just the the stone. It's it's just amazing. Um, other artifacts that are found. There's I don't know if you saw that one picture slide. It was a great big blade knife. Looks like a um, looks like a half moon almost. That one was the most uh, surprising because of the, the bit, how big it was. So the bigger the artifact, the older it tends to be. Just like the thicker the walls of the pottery, the older the pottery tends to be. And that's the re the reason is is because. As they got better at their craft, they just use less material. That's all. Very, very cool. So you you talk about uh, certain materials, and this is another big theme that we've had in the YouTube chat bars. What you used to make this arrowhead that it was so it looked like a gem almost. Was there a different? Did you use different stones or different things for arrowheads for different purposes? Were there some that were ceremonial, some that were used for hunting? Uh, any specifics with that? Well, there's uh, what we call. I don't have one here today, but there's combination tool. It's a little little end scraper with an engraver, so you can drill or you can engrave stuff with it. As I said, there's some like uh, fishing projectile points. Now the stone, of course, is, is chirp that was used on the island. So this is the type here. It's found in sedimentary stone. The whole stone would be limestone. And, and flint uh, is usually found in sedimentary chalk. And uh, so it was the type of stone was the, was the major player in this, in this uh, flint napping. And, it shows the. It actually shows the evolution of, of our brains, how we how we evolutionize over thousands of years. So that's kind of neat. Without flint napping, I think it, this world would be a different place. You know, when it comes to the Bronze Age, uh, 3,900 years ago was the height of the Bronze Age. Before that, you know, all cultures napped. It's just we, as indigenous people here in North America or Turtle Island, I should say, is that we we kept on doing it, which was the main thing. Now, I showed you in that picture about the, this, and then I said, this is just man-made glass. Um, I know it was mentioned the term of lightning glass, but that's not true lightning glass. This is, this is the man-made glass. And one thing about glass is that it's homogenous all the way through, like I'm meaning the, the, the molecular structure of it. I can see through it. It's highly predictable how I break these edges. If I showed you this, I can't see through it. There could be cracks in it. There could be imperfections, and that can cause my arrowhead to break. Or, or go off into the to the radial fracture or hinge fracture, but glass is uh, 
like I said, uh, man-made glass is uh, one of the best stuff to network besides obsidian. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. All right, Miss Camaraders class, they joined us out just a few seconds after we got underway. They're joining us in Toronto down on the road for me. So if you have a question for us, come on in and we'll go to Miss Love in just a minute. Hi, Toronto. Hello. Thanks for having us. Um, we were wondering, actually, when we grow up, so it's a grade three class, when they're old enough and they uh, could have a job working for Parks Canada on the island, what kind of job could they have? Oh, good question. I know we uh, we we hire students. It's called FSWEP. Uh, it's our public service student uh, how we hire students, and uh, so one of their jobs could be from uh, visitor experience uh, as an interpreter. Uh, could be with resource conservation. Uh, could be with uh, general works. We have general works folks that keep our our maintenance of our docks and all that stuff. So yes, we do we do hire students. Uh, you might like to check out FSWEP. We actually, it's funny, in the YouTube chat, we have a, a teacher that's talking about her daughter that's joining the Coast Guard this year with you guys out in the park. So hopefully you guys cross paths. And I love this sort of question. We get this a lot from our speakers is how do you end up with really cool jobs, maybe like Sean in the park service? There are so many roles available. I, I don't know for our students today, if you're in Canada, if you've ever had the chance to visit a Parks Canada site, there are so many roles available there. It's such a spectacular opportunity to, to just sort of preserve and help showcase some of the most iconic and amazing places uh, and species on this planet. It. So very, very cool. And hopefully your students, Miss Cameron, get that chance in the, in the years to come. All right, Miss Love, come on in. And we're going to take a couple questions from YouTube after that. But time flies and you're having fun, people. Uh, so Miss Love joining us at Goderich Public School. Uh, if you want to come on in, go for it. Hi, we had some questions yeah. about, hello there. Do you sell some of the things at Parks Canada, the things that you make? Uh, no, not at the moment. Uh, but I, I foresee in the future that since every we only have 47 national parks across Canada from coast to coast to coast, but every park is unique. And um, I can see in the future, yes, possibly in the future for our park, anyway, since we're unique, uh, every park's unique, of course, but but uh, that's that's uh, that could be possible. Awesome, I'd certainly get one. Um, it, it's again such a cool thing to see all this craft in, in person. And you know, to wrap up the broadcast in a minute, some of the big themes of questions we've been getting on YouTube from so many teachers are how long does it take beginning to end to make a quality, you know, arrowhead in an arrow, everything that you'd need to actually hunt something if you wanted to do that? How long would that take? Well, like I said, I'm not a master, so a master <laughs> would, would, would probably bust one up in 10 minutes or so, but uh, this one here in particular took me about three hours or so. Okay. Uh, as I said, I'm not a master because the main thing about flint napping is that you got to get the right thickness, right? And it's really hard to get that nice thickness so it's get hopped in, into your shaft. Uh, but yeah, if I was a master, it wouldn't take too long, uh, especially on the fly. Let's say if I was hunting uh, with my group with my 50 to 100 hunters and I, mm -hmm. uh, I broke an arrowhead, uh, I'd probably have some already made, but I'd probably also have a little nodule in my backpack or somewhere. Uh, that I can go to and, uh, and and produce another one. Yeah. And, and keep in mind that some of these arrowheads that they do make, they they break, right? Because they, they break off and you have to make it into another tool or yeah. you can make it into another arrowhead. So uh, the stone itself, the chert and the flint was never ever wasted. And when I'm when I'm done flint napping, actually it's it's my uh, duty to repatriate it back to Mother Earth. It yeah. goes back into the ground. I don't just throw it away. It goes back into the ground. And I also lay down my tobacco to give thanks for that stone that it, because it comes from earth. You know, rocks and minerals. Minerals are in all of us. We drink water and minerals are in water. And, you know, we're all connected so, so uniquely that I think as humans, we lost that ability, uh, that, 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 that thought. That's what nature represents. I mean, when people come to the park, they see nature and they get this feeling. Hmm. It's in all of us. Sean, I don't think we could have a more beautiful uh, end than that. So what I want to do is just make sure that our teachers have the ability to look up more and find out more about the work that you guys are doing in Georgian Bay and beyond. Again, this Cross Canada virtual road trip has been a partnership between us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, the amazing team at Parks Canada, and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. So do check out those websites. Lots more to come. And of course, if you want to see our whole series past and future, uh, check out the Cross Canada virtual road trip link that I just brought up on the screen. 
Finally, two last things uh, for teachers. We had way more questions than we could possibly answer today. We will send you all a Padlet link where you'll be able to share more questions that the team at Georgian Bay and Sean will hopefully answer in the coming uh, days and weeks to come. And finally, at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, this is especially for our Canadian classrooms today, this has become a big part of the curriculum and big thing that we're really focusing on in our schools is these uh, this understanding of our ancestry, understanding of Indigenous people that are on the land that we occupy today. And so nativeland.ca is a website that a lot of our speakers in the past have highlighted. Uh, for me in Toronto, I learned that I'm on the territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. John, of course, made a beautiful land acknowledgement at the beginning, so I'd really encourage you all to check out that website at the end of the broadcast. Sean, thank you so, so much for your time today. Uh, is there any last thing you'd like to share with us before we bring in everyone for a big goodbye? Well, I just want to say, uh, you know, stay safe out there. Uh, we're going to be coming out of this COVID-19 and and get out to nature. Uh, get out to nature and uh, and and locate your national park and uh, come and visit. And if you see me in the park, say, hey, Sean, I saw you. And uh, could you give me a tour or something? I'd be more than welcome to. So in my language, big, big, big chimigwich. Thank you very much. And I'll say bomb on P. We never say goodbye in, in, our, in our language. It means we'll see you all later, okay? So, bama pi, kwa min, na. Bama pi, come on, win, na, maybe. Bama pi, kwa min, na. Bama pi, kwa, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I'm a Padawan learner with. Yeah, uh, there you go. You're not a uh, you <laughs> Let's bring up our friends, Miss Michael, Mr. Clark, and Miss Kemra to say a big farewell uh, with us. Thank you guys so, so much for. Unmute, everybody. You can say thank you.